Well, hello everyone. My name is Neil Andrews and I am editor of the Pain Research Forum. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Neurobiologic Mechanisms Driving Cancer Pain, to be presented by Dr. Brian Schmidt. Today's webinar is actually our 24th webinar overall, and we're really excited about today. Uh, it's actually our first webinar or ever on the topic of cancer pain. So we're really thrilled to be able to present this webinar today. Uh, in terms of format, it will be our usual format. Uh, Dr. Schmidt will present a talk that will last about 35 minutes or so. After the talk, our panelists will take a couple of minutes to make a comment on the presentation uh, and or raise some questions. And then the remaining time will be devoted to panel discussion amongst the panelists and audience questions as well. Speaking of which, um, as always, we encourage everyone in the audience to submit questions. You can submit questions at any time by typing them into the questions area of your control panel window. And the webinars are designed to leave plenty of time for discussion, so please send us uh, in your questions. And again, you can do that at any time. One uh, technical note, if you're having any trouble with the audio, um, if you're using your computer for the audio, make sure that the volume is turned up on your speakers. Um, and if you're still having trouble, you can try the phone. And conversely, if you're on the phone and you're having trouble, you can try using the computer for audio. Usually switching from one to the other will solve any problems. So I now have the pleasure of introducing our moderator. Judy Pace. Uh, Judy is Director of the Cancer Pain Program, Division of Hematology and Oncology, and also a Research Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. Judy, welcome to the webinar. It's really great to have you here. Please go ahead. Thank you, Neil, and thanks to Pain Research Forum for finally addressing cancer pain, an extraordinarily important topic. This is wonderful. So we've got two well-known panelists today who have conducted research in this very topic. Brian Davis, who is a professor of neurobiology at the University of Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, and Durga Mohapatra, or DP, as everyone calls him, um, who is an associate professor at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And both of our panelists are going to contribute important questions and comments after our presenter. And I am very honored to introduce Brian Schmidt. Brian is DDS, MD, and PhD. He is a professor in the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery and the director of the Bluestone Center for Clinical Research at New York University College of Dentistry. Dr. Schmidt is a surgeon and a scientist who studies cancer pain in patients and in preclinical models. Brian's clinical efforts are dedicated to the comprehensive surgical management of oral cancer, and his scientific work explores the neurobiology of cancer pain. He is a phenomenal scientist and a superb speaker, and I know you're going to enjoy this presentation, which is called Neurobiologic Mechanisms Driving Cancer Pain. Brian, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Judy, uh, for that very nice introduction. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Pain Research Forum for uh, hosting this webinar on cancer pain. Um, and as Judy mentioned, it's a, a clinical challenge, and at least for the patients that I see outside of survival, this is their uh, single biggest problem. Um, before I talk about neurobiologic mechanisms driving cancer pain, it's important to understand that for most solid tumors, um, the genome is highly unstable. And what that means is that cancers rapidly change both in their genome as well as their phenotype. And so, unfortunately, there's not a universal or overarching mechanism driving cancer pain. And even for the individual patient, one mechanism which might be driving cancer pain at one site will be different than the mechanism driving cancer pain following metastasis. Cancers follow classic Darwinian principles and respond to environmental pressure over time. And so they evolve over time and space. And so it's a moving target. 
But given that, there's a few principles that hold true with regard to cancer pain. Um, cancer pain depends on three factors that I've identified over the years of both studying cancer pain and seeing patients. First, the phenotype of cancer pain is going to depend on the anatomic site that's affected. It's also going to depend on the function of that anatomic site. And then finally, it's going to depend on the type of cancer. And if I were giving this talk 10 years ago, when I talk about type of cancer, I would uh, be talking about, let's say, a pancreatic adenocarcinoma versus a lung squamous cell carcinoma. But we now recognize within both types of those tumors, there's a high amount of genomic heterogeneity. And so when I talk about the type of cancer, I'm talking about a specific location at a specific point in time in that patient. Um, to highlight these three features, I'd like to present to you a patient that I saw just this last week. This is a 56-year-old man who was referred to me for a destructive lesion of the right mandible. And I'm showing you two views of his CAT scan. I'm showing you on the left-hand side the axial view and on the right-hand side the coronal view. This is the patient's lower jaw. If you look on the patient's right-hand side, and it's reversed because of the way the patient uh, is lying in the scanner, but even if you're not used to reading CT scans, you can see a destructive process involving the right mandible. And in the coronal view, we see a destructive process as well as something invading into the soft tissue. Now, when I asked this patient about his symptoms, including pain, his pain phenotype was unusual. 95% of the patients that I see have head neck squamous cell carcinoma. And when they do have pain, the phenotype is reproducible. So I knew when I saw this patient that the diagnosis was not likely squamous cell carcinoma. And at the top of my differential diagnosis is jaw osteosarcoma. My plan was to take him to the operating room for a biopsy, and in preparing him for the operating room, I got this chest x-ray. This is this, the same patient's chest x-ray, seen two days after that CAT scan. And you can see on the patient's left-hand side, something's not right. This opacification is consistent with a pleural effusion. Also on the plain film, you can see a number of nodules which should not be there. Um, the patient had a thoracentesis where cells from this left portion of the lung can be removed, and those were read out as adenocarcinoma. And when we get a chest CT, there's a number of w very worrisome nodules. Not only did this patient have nodules in his lung, he had them in his liver, his thoracic spine, as well as his ribs, and in fact had a pathologic rib fracture. Interestingly, he only had pain in the oral facial region. I'm going to show you this patient's response to the instrument that we use to characterize oral cancer pain. It's an instrument that we published back in 2004. And the reason we developed this pain questionnaire is because we were interested in distinguishing spontaneous from functional pain. We used descriptors and adjectives that had been developed for the McGill pain questionnaire. We used intensity, sharpness, and aching. And the questions alternate between asking a question which would elicit or measure spontaneous pain, followed by a question that would elicit functional pain. So we ask when you're not talking, eating, or drinking, how intense is your pain? And the following question asks when you are doing those oral facial function, how intense is the pain? So questions one, three, and five hopefully identify spontaneous pain, and questions two, four, and six identify functional pain. I'd like you to focus on question seven. We added this one where we're asking about mechanical sensitivity because in my experience, that's what oral cancer patients have a problem with. 
you'll notice that this patient has significant sensitivity to touch. But if you look at question eight, where we're asking about impact on function, it does not impact on function. And I asked the patient about this because we almost never see this combination of high sensitivity and low impact on function. And what this patient told me is if I chew on the affected side, the right side, it hurts. But I can chew on the unaffected side and it doesn't hurt. He's retired, he didn't spend much time talking, so he actually functioned quite well. Now I should tell you that metastatic lesions to the mandible are quite rare. So it was unusual for me to see this pain phenotype. I'm going to contrast that case, which is adenocarcinoma metastasizing to the mandible, to this case. And this is what I typically see. This is a patient, this is a young woman in her 30s, who has oral squamous cell carcinoma of the left lateral tongue, which you can see here. It's significantly um, not that apparent clinically, uh, but she has a squamous cell carcinoma. When I asked her to complete the pain questionnaire, this is her response. And if you look at questions seven and eight, you can see that she has about six out of ten uh, mechanical sensitivity and it is impacting function. She works uh, as a teacher and has to talk and has significant problems getting through the day and eating and drinking are really challenging. Now, with the tongue, one of the challenges is even if you chew on the right-hand side, your tongue's still moving, and you can see that her tongue would be scraping against the teeth, and that causes significant uh, allodynia. So this patient has oral squamous cell carcinoma, and we recently evaluated the last 58 oral cancer patients that we've seen and enrolled in our study. And what I'm showing you here is mechanical sensitivity, sorry about that, mechanical sensitivity versus oral facial dysfunction. So question seven versus question eight. And this is telling because what you can see is a fairly good correlation between seven and eight for those patients that have pain. And about 30% of oral cancer patients report high levels of pain, and about 30% of patients, thankfully, don't have a problem with pain. And we found this consistently over the years, that there's a subset of oral cancer, patient, uh, oral cancer patients that don't have pain. What's important to remember about all of the cancers depicted here is they're very similar in their clinical phenotype, meaning when I look in the oral cavity, the cancers look almost identical. They look almost identical under the microscope, but when we've evaluated these cancers at a genomic level, they're highly variable, getting back to that point that I made initially about genomic heterogeneity. Well, this finding that I've just spoken of where the pain phenotype depends on the anatomic site affected, the function involved with that site, and the type of tumor has been held up with preclinical models. This is a study that was published by Dr. Pat Manti's group back in 2003 where he looked at three different mirroring models of cancer pain. And he used mirroring carcinoma cell lines, including a, a sarcoma, a melanoma, and a colon um, cancer. He inoculated it inoculated the cancers uh, into a limb and looked at ongoing pain versus ambulatory and palpation-evoked pain. The ambulatory pain was measured on a rotor rod. With palpation-evoked, they would palpate the tumor-affected limb and then look at behavior. And what's interesting here is the difference that we see across these three cancers. So the sarcoma-bearing mice demonstrated extensive ongoing ambulatory and palpation-induced pain behaviors. So across all three of the assays, sarcoma is causing no susceptive behavior. Melanoma-bearing mice only demonstrated palpation-induced pain behavior, and the colon-bearing mice exhibited only ambulatory pain behaviors. So what we see in the patient is held up in this preclinical model. The next point I want to make is my understanding and bias that cancer pain is generated in the cancer microenvironment. 
we know through the work of a number of different groups that there are central changes, including changes in the spinal cord. We see an increase in substance P, increase in CFOS expression, um, there's increased dynorphin, there's astrocyte activation. We see those changes. But the question is, do those changes impact on cancer pain? And I don't think so over the long term. In fact, those changes that we see in the cord probably die down after the cancers are removed. So again, the action seems to be in the cancer microenvironment. And to illustrate that finding, um, I'm going to show you work that we use to validate that pain questionnaire that I previously mentioned to you. So we took a series of patients and evaluated their pain immediately before surgery, meaning on the morning of surgery, and then seven to ten days after surgery when they were no longer on analgesics. And it's the same group of patients followed longitudinally. But if you just focus on question seven, sensitivity to touch, you can see that they go from a pain level of about 65 out of 100 to quite low levels of pain. This has been my clinical experience, and I've also confirmed it with a number of my head and neck cancer colleagues, where for the patients that have pain preoperatively, Oftentimes, when they wake up, they will say the pain is gone. There is a noticeable change. Well, it took us about a decade to figure this out, but the truth is if we had gone back in the clinical literature and looked carefully, this would have been apparent. And I like to use the example of Ulysses S. Grant, who was our president um, following being the uh, general of the U.S. Army from uh, 1864 to 1869. He then went on to serve as president from 69 to 1877. In 1884, he developed cancer, and he is, in fact, our only U.S. president to die from cancer, and he died from oral cancer. He spent the last couple of months of his life working on his biography, and he was here in New York, and he had severe pain related to his cancer. He had a number of doctors that were attending to him, and nothing could relieve the pain except for cocaine applied directly to the cancer. And this is from the front page of the May 1st, 1885 New York Times. You'll notice that cocaine was applied twice a day at first, giving almost instant relief from the pain. Now to give you the historical context of cocaine and the year that it was used for Ulysses S. Grant, the first time that it was published in the United States was in the same year in the New York Medical Journal by Halstead who used it to um, create a nerve block. So Ulysses S. Grant was fortunate to have this available. It was the only thing that could relieve the pain and really places the focus in the cancer microenvironment. So with our understanding that the cancer microenvironment is critical, there was almost a century where our understanding of cancer pain lagged behind because we didn't have a preclinical model. Now there are some terrific authors and investigators and clinicians that have wrote extensively and beautifully about cancer pain and we can learn a lot from those papers. A couple that I'll just quickly mention, uh, there was a British surgeon by the name of Wilfred Trotter who wrote in the early 1900s. Frank Turnbull was a Canadian neurosurgeon who wrote in the 40s. Uh, a set of uh, English surgeons by the name of Corian Hitchcock wrote in the 60s. And then more recently, Kathy Foley and her team wrote through the 80s up till now. And when you look at those descriptions of cancer pain, you do get significant insight into mechanisms driving cancer pain. However, in 1998, the field got a finger grip from this publication. Um, it was actually an abstract that was presented at the 1998 Society for Neuroscience meeting. It was in Los Angeles at that time by the group out of University of Minnesota. And you'll notice that a number of the investigators, including Pat Manti, Alvin Bites, and George Wilcox, have gone on and continue to inform the field. 
But this model that they described in 1998 really opened up the field. There's a couple of key things that I want you to notice about this model. They used melanoma as their initial cell line. I'm going to be talking to you just a bit about the importance of control when we're trying to glean information from these preclinical models. But you'll notice in their control, they used heat-killed cells injected into the contralateral leg. It's not the ideal control, but certainly, especially for the time, it's, it's an outstanding control. Because so often, you'll see cancer pain articles where the cell media alone, and our group has done this as well, just because of convenience and sometimes getting a benign a counterpart, but oftentimes the cell media alone is the control. And we know that both benign and malignant cell have a number of processes, including proliferation, invasion, which might be causing nociception, which is not distinct to the carcinoma. And so having a good, a good a model is critical. Now, it, since this article came out, there's been hundreds of articles published on mechanisms of cancer pain, and a couple uh, members of my research team have tried to stay up on this, and we've identified 453 articles to date on mechanism of cancer pain, um, and this is in uh, non-human vertebrates. It's also a manageable amount of literature that one can get through um, and really have a feel for the cancer pain field. Now, I want to get back to the controls. Um, this is a paper that was published last year by Alvin Bites Group, which really shows the ideal control. What he was interested in here is looking at spinal astrocyte activity and aromatase expression in the dorsal horn. But you can see he compared melanoma to fibrosarcoma. And he used a mirroring model and then looked at no susceptive behavior. Um, the uh, preclinic model was exposed to 10 applications of von Frey fibers, and then they looked at the response. You can see that the fibrosarcoma model is displaying significantly more no susceptive behavior, where in the control, um, which is melanoma, we're not seeing no susceptive behavior. So melanoma is certainly growing in the tissue and the bone. It's proliferating. It's generating an acidic environment. But there's something unique about fibrosarcoma that is separate from those processes that I just mentioned that's responsible for the nociception. It turns out that melanoma is typically not painful. I don't see many melanoma patients because it's usually UV-induced, and of course you don't have UV radiation in the oral cavity. Um, oral melanoma does develop. Um, it's extremely difficult to cure. I've only had three patients in my entire career, and despite having destructive melanoma, none of them had pain. Now, we used melanoma, uh, similar to Dr. Bite's group, a number of years ago to compare pain to squamous cell carcinoma. And at that time, we were interested in endothelin, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But we wanted it a comparator to oral squamous cell carcinoma. And we had looked at a number of cell lines that produced endothelin. And what we found is that our oral squamous cell carcinoma cell line, HSC3, which is available through ATCC, produced very high levels of uh, endothelin, but melanoma didn't. The other thing is that we noticed that melanoma produced quite large destructive lesions, and so we used it as a comparator. There's a lot of data on this graph, and so I'll try to uh, focus you on a couple of the key features. So on the x-axis is day post paw inoculation, and at this time we had not developed our oral cancer model, and we were simply inoculating into the soft tissue of the hind paw and then measuring no susceptive behavior. On this right vertical axis, we're looking at tumor volume. And if you compare melanoma to squamous cell carcinoma, you can see that especially after about three weeks, melanoma produces quite a large tumor. But if you just look at the nociceptive behavior over time, what you see is that squamous cell carcinoma is producing more nociception relative 
to a melanoma. There's some level of nociception, but clearly oral squamous cell carcinoma is producing higher levels. The reason I mention this is one goes forward and tries to design these studies, you have to think about the mouse model or the rat model or whichever preclinical model you're using, your control. And then the other thing you need to think about, which is critical, especially as we try to move these studies toward uh, clinical applications, is the assay that you're going to use. I was very uh, delighted to see Pat Manti's group publish this paper this year looking at skin pain and skeletal pain in a sarcoma model. Now I have to tell you that clinical impressions are notoriously inaccurate, but I would always make the claim at meetings and when I'd visit abstracts and I'd look at a paper on sarcoma that I've seen patients with sarcoma of the femur and I've asked these patients if they had any allodynia or hypersensitivity, of course I'd use lay terms, um, of the foot or the skin of the foot and they would not. I never found a patient who had a sarcoma of the extremity where either their hand or their foot was affected. However, if you looked at the preclinical cancer pain literature, so often you would see a sarcoma model that was produced by inoculating into the femur and then testing for PAW withdrawal. And the limited amount of information we get from that approach can be seen in this study by uh, Dr. Manti's group. He used an osteolytic mirroring sarcoma model where he creates an orthrotomy, drills into the bone, places the uh, sarcoma and then plugs the hole so that the cells can't escape. So he's truly looking at a bone cancer pain model. He then looked at skin pain by measuring a nociceptive behavior based on PAW withdrawal threshold. And then he looked at skeletal pain and he had a number of different, he actually had three different assays that he used to measure a skeletal pain. But in the data that I'm showing you, he looked at spontaneous nociceptive behavior, including guarding, weight bearing, tending to the affected limb, flinching the affected limb, and sporadic hopping. These are the features that we would see in a patient who had sarcoma into the bone. So let's look at his data comparing skin pain and skeletal pain. And he actually used two different drugs. In both cases, they were biologics or monoclonal antibodies. He's looking at anti-P2X3 as well as anti-NGF. And both of these mediators, P2X3 and NGF, or the purinergic receptor and NGF, along with its cognate receptor, TREK A, have been shown to be responsible for cancer pain. So if you looked at skin pain and looked at the effect of anti-P2X3, which is the gray bar, you would see there's a significant reduction in skin pain at 28 and 35 days after injection. Turns out that anti-NGF is also antinociceptive at all time points. Look at skeletal pain. It turns out, you can see this in the black bars, that the, the only agent which is effective is the anti-NGF. In fact, the anti-P2X3 has no effect on skeletal pain. So in thinking about how we could translate this work to the clinic, if you were to be studying bone cancer pain and you were to use withdrawal based on skin responsiveness and P2X3, the drug anti-P2X3 X3 might look promising. When you got to that to the clinic, clearly that trial would fail. To further highlight the importance of the model as well as the associated assay, I'd like to present a data that was published a number of years ago in the Journal of Neuroscience by David Lamb, who was a postdoc in our laboratory at that time. And David was interested in proteases in PAR2, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But in this publication, David used three different models. The first model involved injection of the supernatant from a human oral squamous cell carcinoma cell line directly into the tongue. So all you have are those extracellular secreted mediators. You don't have any effect of the cells. Now, the 
device and assay that we use in our laboratory is based on gnaw time or the time it requires for the rodent to get through an obstruction after being confined. Um, we title this device and assay the dolanometer. Dolor is based on pain. Nometer is based on the activity that we're measuring. What you can see is that indeed we see increase in nociceptive behavior which then falls off. Excuse me, which then falls off after a couple of hours. The advantage of this model is that you're just looking at the secreted mediator. So if you're interested in a specific mediator without the effect of the cells proliferating and growing, then this is a good model. Another advantage of this model is that you can use a wild type mouse. The other model that we've used and many groups have used is the one I'm showing here in the second panel, which is a, a xenograph model. In this case, we use that same cell line, HSC3, inoculated it into the tongue. The carcinoma grows, it destroys tissue, and as you can see, we certainly see no susceptive behavior. This is a pain-producing oral squamous cell carcinoma cell line. Now, the disadvantage of this model is that you have to have an immunocompromised mouse. So you're taking out cellular-mediated immunity, and clearly, if you're interested in the role of the immune system and T cells and cell-mediated immunity in cancer pain, this would not be a good choice. Also, you're having to inoculate the carcinoma subcutaneously. That's not how cancer develops. Cancer develops from a normal cell having a gain of function due to a mutation. Then you can get some further changes at the genome, and then ultimately you go from a pre-neoplastic state to a neoplastic state. The best model that captures those processes that I just mentioned is a model that can be produced by exposing the uh, rodent to 4-NQO or 4-nitroquinolone 1-oxide, which is a carcinogen. Um, you can see in this far panel a squamous cell carcinoma developing on the tongue um, of a mouse. Um, this uh, goes through the same process that occurs in the human. And what you see is that after exposure to foreign QO, um, that the mice uh, do develop oral cancers and they exhibit pain behavior. I want to show you more recent work by Nicole Sheff, who's a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory who's taken up this 4NQO model. The downside of the 4NQO model is it's labor intensive. You have to wait the several weeks to develop your model. Um, the water has to be changed each day. Not all of the mice get cancer, only about 20 to 30 percent. But there's significant payoff in terms of understanding the natural process of carcinoma as well as the associated mechanisms driving cancer pain. So this is a coronal view of the mouse tongue, and this is the normal epithelium of the mouse tongue. As the mouse is exposed to foreign QO, one or a few of these cells are undergoing to undergo changes. Ultimately, they become invasive, and the basophilic or dark colored cells you're seeing is the squamous cell carcinoma. They invade into the musculature of the tongue and impact function. You can see in this lower panel that Nicole has now duplicated or replicated the uh, data that Dave generated a number of years ago, the black arrows where the foreign QO uh, was stopped. Now, that I've talked about the models, what I'd like to do is go back to the cancer microenvironment and show you some data that speaks to possible mechanisms within the cancer microenvironment that's driving cancer pain. I showed you previously this clinical photo of the young woman with squamous cell carcinoma. This is the histomicograph from her cancer. The pink areas are the uh, muscles of the tongue. This darker area where you have basophilic pleomorphic cells is the carcinoma. And what you'll notice is this intimate relationship between the carcinoma and branches, distal branches of the lingual nerve. You have one here, there's one here closely associated with the carcinoma, and another here. You also have a, an associated immune infiltrate. And each of these processes, the carcinoma, the perineural involvement, 
and the immune process could be contributing to cancer pain. This is a diagrammatic representation of that cancer microenvironment where I have depicted the primary afferent nociceptor with the associated receptors. Um, there's the cancer-associated immune system as well as cancer-associated fibroblasts. I want to highlight a couple of these uh, critical mediators. Um, I'm going to skip peptides as well as proteases in PAR2 because I'm going to finish the talk talking about both of those mechanisms. Um, endothelin 1 is clearly participating in a number of different types of cancer. Studies over the years have shown that several different cancers, including hepatocellular, breast, colon, pancreatic, endometrial, lung, and head and neck produce endothelin. Endothelin is a 21 amino acid. It's a vasoactive peptide. It's responsible for activating the endothelin A receptor on primary afferent nociceptor which leads to sensitization and activation. There's also an interesting mechanism where endothelin 1 activates the endothelin B receptor. Um, going through the literature, the first uh, role for endothelin and cancer pain that I can uh, find, at least in preclinical studies, is a study that was published by Gudar Stavar and Gary Strickertz in July 2001 in Journal of Neuroscience, where they were looking at endothelial activation of different nociceptor subtypes. In that same year, in December, George Wilcox used a fibrosarcoma model to demonstrate the role of endothelin. He used a number of um, selective endothelin A antagonists to demonstrate the role of endothelin. The group also reported on a very interesting method where they developed a microperfusion technique to actually measure endothelin coming off the fibrosarcoma in the bone. Um, endothelin also has a very interesting mechanism where it seems to sensitize endothelial cells to mechanical stimulation, which leads to secretion of ATP. This was demonstrated by uh, Dr. John Levine and his group a couple of years ago. It wasn't studied in the context of cancer, but given the robust angiogenesis that occurs in the cancer microenvironment, this could be an interesting mechanism. Now, the role of ATP that's secreted by the cancer cells has been shown to be involved with a number of different cancer models, including bone cancer pain, and Yi Ye, who was previously a postdoc in our laboratory, who's now an assistant professor here at NYU, has demonstrated not, in, not only the role of ATP, but its activation of P2X3 heterotrimer involved in cancer pain. It's interesting to think about ATP being secreted secreted at high levels of the cancer because we normally think of cancers as trying to use and retain that ATP for duplication of DNA. We know that the extracellular microenvironment is acidic, it has a low pH. The protons can activate not only trip channels, but also uh, acid uh, sensing ion channels. The role of trip V has been demonstrated across a number of cancer pain models. Um, probably uh, the most interesting and clinically applicable is the work done by Mike Ayatarola in 2005 in Journal of Clinical Investigation, um, looking at the role of uh, trip V in sarcoma. Um, nerve growth factor was first demonstrated in 2005 by Pat Manti's group and other uh, growth factors including BD and F clearly have a role in cancer pain. The really interesting thing about Pat's initial publication is he actually showed that it's the prostate carcinoma associated fibroblasts as the source of nerve growth factor. For the work that we've done with nerve growth factor, and this work was also done by Yi Ye, um, we found that the cancers themselves produce high levels of nerve growth factor. Okay, I want to come back and talk to you about why I see uh, PAR2 and proteases as such an attractive target for management of cancer pain. 
So I'm showing you here the histomicrograph of that same patient, the young woman with squamous cell carcinoma. This is a lower power view than what I previously showed you. But what you see are these invading packets of malignant epithelium that are destroying tissue and then invading. And we know that that process of invasion requires proteases, whether it's MMPs, collagenases, trips, and Cancer seem to be ubiquitous in their capacity to produce uh, to produce these proteases and secrete them into the microenvironment. So potentially, it's a universal mechanism. The second reason is because going back to David Lamb's work, this is the only mediator and associated receptor I found that when you can completely take it out, and we did it with a number of different approaches, including a knockout, and uh, this of course is a, a global part to knockout, but what we see is a complete reduction in pain. So we've looked at a number of different mediators, including endothelin, endothelin NGF, ATP, and its associated purinergic receptors. And when we antagonize those receptors, we get about a 40 to 60 percent reduction in nociceptive behavior. But here you're seeing complete reduction in nociceptive behavior. The other interesting thing is that PAR2, I think, is strategically located relative to nociceptive pathways. So I first want to show you some data that speaks to uh, proteases being in the cancer microenvironment. One of the approaches that we've used is to uh, use microdialysis in patients at the time of the operation where a very small microdialysis probe, this is the same probe that, that was developed for brain microdialysis, rather than putting it into the brain, we place it directly into the squamous cell carcinoma. So where you see this yellow line is a centimeter of a membrane that allows equilibration across that membrane. By specification, it has about 100 kD cutoff. Um, we think that we're probably losing anything larger than 50 kD. And of course, one downside of this approach is that some mediators are simply getting stuck to the membrane. We place a probe into the carcinoma. We place a contralateral probe to collect from so-called normal tissue. And we've been able to demonstrate that these cancers produce high levels of proteases. Another technique that we've recently uh, developed based on the work of Nigel Bunnett, who studies proteases PAR2 and inflammatory uh, bowel syndrome, is to actually take a small slice of the cancer at the time of the operation, immediately place that carcinoma into continuously oxygenated media, and then over the next 20 to 30 minutes collect supernatant or secreted products. And it's important, I, I, I keep talking about extracellular secreted products, that's what the primary afferent is seeing. So many studies, including ours in the past, you grind up the tumor and look for what might be present that could be activating those receptors, but if you just focus on those secreted mediators, it uh, reduces your list of candidates. So we've used those three approaches that I've just mentioned where we've taken sli small slices of the cancer, we use contralateral tissue as the control in the same patient, obviously, put it into oxygenated media, and then 30 minutes later collect the supernatant. I told you the technique that we've done for many years where we grind up the tumors and see what's present, and then we also have our microdialysis method. We've been measuring trypsin for a number of years, and what you see across this small group of patients that trypsin is elevated. That was no surprise. We've demonstrated that in our animal model. And we've also shown this across many patients. So we know that trypsin seems to be increased across patients. We started to work, uh, do work with two cysteine proteases, uh, legumane and cathepsiness. And this is work that I've done in collaboration with uh, Laura Edginton Mitchell at Monash University and Nigel Bunnett. But what you can see for these two proteases, legumane and cathepsiness, that we're also seeing elevated levels.
Now I mentioned to you that PAR2 is strategically located. PAR2 is the G-protein coupled receptor. It me its mechanism involves cleavage at a specific site depending on the protease and then this remaining so-called tethered ligand can swing back and activate the receptor. It turns out that what happens after activation depends on the location of where you get that cleavage and so your second messaging pathways that are activated are going to be different between trypsin and cathepsin S, which is intriguing. This is from a review that was published by uh, Nigel Bunnett and his group. And if you can imagine uh, PAR2, it could either be in this location or this location. The downstream mechanisms that get activated depend on the protease activating it. Now, it turns out that when you activate PAR2, you get transactivation of receptors that are critical to cancer pain. And we, in particular, are interested in TRIP-V4 um, because TRIP-V4 seems to uh, mediate mechanical hyperalgesia or mechanical stress. It's been shown by both, uh, or I should say in collaboration between Nigel Bunnett and Wolfgang Litke, that without TRIP-V4, activation of PAR2 does not lead to mechanical hyperalgesia. So it's, it has a very interesting location which might explain how when you take PAR2 out, it takes other receptors out. I'm not showing it on this diagram, but it turns out that EGFR is also transactivated by PAR2. This is potentially important given the work the uh, work of uh, William Maxner and Luda Diachenko on SNPs and EGFR in their large uh, opera cohort and associated GWAS. Um, just to finish on uh, PAR2 and TRIP V4, this is work that was done um, by Nicole Sheff, who labeled uh, tongue afferents with dye I. It's a retrograde label, and then looked at the Mindang actually did the staining in trigeminal ganglia, but looked at uh, co-expression of TRIP V4 and PAR2 in trigeminal ganglia in those afferents innervating the tongue and indeed their co-express. So I see this as a potential mechanism contributing to cancer pain. Now I just want to finish by talking about endogenous analgesic mechanisms because I think this is another uh, potential application for treatment of patients. So I'm going to uh, talk briefly about work. Again, this is work with endothelin. and it was published by Gudar Stavar and uh, Gary Strickertz in a 2001 Nature Medicine paper where they showed this interesting mechanism whereby normal keratinocytes, when activated by endothelin, um, activating the endothelin B receptor, you get local secretion of beta endorphin and they showed an associated change in nociceptive behavior, that is a reduction in nociceptive behavior. When I saw this article, I thought, well, potentially carcinomas and oral squamous cell carcinomas derived from keratinocytes might have this capacity. So the first question we ask is, does oral squamous cell carcinoma express endothelin B receptor? And the answer was no. And when I say no, I don't mean low expression or down regulation. There was no expression of endothelin B. We looked at both the transcript and the protein level. Now there's a number of ways that the cells can down regulate or stop transcription of a receptor. Um, we thought about possible mutation. We thought about possibly endothelin B was being generated, but it was a non-functional protein. But we also thought about promoter methylation. And this is a work from Chiviet in the laboratory where she was interested in methylation of EDNRB. EDNRB is the gene for uh, the endothelin B receptor. What was done in this study is we took 20 oral cancer patients and we harvested their oral cancer and we used their contralateral normal tissue and then using an epitype array, um, she went on to quantify gene promoter methylation across the exons and a number of CPG sites. 
This is the heat map comparing methylation between the oral cancer and the squamous cell carcinoma, where you see a red box that's a heavily methylated area, where you see green that's low levels of methylation. And when you compare the cancers in the patients to their own control, you can see at least for EDNRB product 1, 2, and 3, very uh, low levels, almost no levels of methylation in the normal tissue, but the cancers are heavily methylated. It turns out that EDNRB product 4 is past the transcription start site, so probably has no effect. But again, in these tissues, we were seeing no expression of endothelin B. So we thought about mechanisms where we could force expression of endothelin B. Let's see what happens if oral squamous cell carcinoma expresses endothelin B. Now I should tell you that we studied endothelin, and what we found is that for a number of cancers, not all cancers, and not all oral cancers, but for a number, they produce very high levels of endothelin. We've actually been able not only to identify this when the, within the cancer, but if we take their saliva for those patients that have an endothelin secreting squamous cell carcinoma, it's high enough to pick up in the saliva. So we know that agonist is there. What happens if we force expression of the associated receptor on the cancer? And so we used an adenoviral vector where we transduced, in this case we were using uh, the HSC3 cell line. We forced the first uh, expression of the endothelin B receptor depicted here in red and then inoculated those mice into the hind paw with the transduce and non-transduce cell line. And what you see in the transduce one is a reduction in the nociceptive behavior. We've done quite a bit of work, uh, not only with endothelin B, but a number of other receptors. Um, we've shown that in a couple of the cases, the mechanism does depend on local secretion of opioids, where we've actually measured opioids in the cancer microenvironment and reversed the behavior with naloxone. Now, the challenge here and the gap is that the use of an adenoviral vector in humans is almost certainly not going to happen. Um, it's been very challenging. What happens with an adenoviral vector is you can generate a very robust immune response, and in a couple of cases this seems to have led to a patient deaths in the trial that have used adenoviral vectors. The transcription or transduction efficiency is quite low, so it's not a good method. Uh, but I can tell you we've been exploring non-viral methods of gene delivery and transfection, and we have a paper coming out this uh, year in pain where we've used a non-viral approach to deliver genes directly to the cancer to lead to the secretion of opioids that uh, might ultimately reduce cancer pain. So again, I'd like to thank uh, the panel and the Pain Research Forum uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you, Brian. That was an, a phenomenal exploration of the microenvironment and pain mechanisms um, with oral squamous cell carcinomas. Um, I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit questions through the chat box, so please do that. And we will um, then turn to our panelists. We'll start with Brian Davis. Um, Brian, would you like to comment on um, Brian's presentation or raise any questions that you may have. Um, so I have a couple of comments and first I have to say that that was a fantastic talk Brian and on the one hand talking about cancer pain can be depressing but on the other hand it sounds to a certain extent I'd like you to comment on this more that much of the mechanisms can at least be restricted to the periphery and as an afferentologist and someone who studies or spends a lot of their time out in the periphery it's sort of heart, it's heartening to hear that your patients also often get relief when uh, you remove the uh, tumor. Um, can you talk about that a little bit more and about the patients who continue to have pain afterwards and whether or not you think that's due to central sensitization or the role of the central nervous system in those patients who continue to have pain after their surgery? Great. Uh, thank you, Brian. It, that's an excellent question. And um, I was uh, very happy to say that I, I recently visited another a num another university and had the opportunity to meet with my head and neck cancer colleagues who know that I'm interested in cancer pain and they 
they uh, stated what I found as well, that these patients do have complete reduction of pain after the cancer's excise. Now, uh, to directly address your question, there are some patients, and I find about 10 to 15 percent of patients are going to have post-operative pain. And I think that this is very similar to what we see in other surgeries where for whatever reason, 10 to 15 percent of patients uh, develop pain. It probably is central sensitization as, as it moves into three and six months after surgery. So there's going to be a subset um, where it's, it's not related to the cancer. Um, it's simply post-surgical and whatever injury might be happening. The other thing is that when I see a patient who I've treated, if they report to me they're having pain, it most often is a recurrence. So certainly if you completely resect the cancer, and then for whatever reason they have a recurrence. Pain is a very good biomarker that the cancer is back. And one thing I didn't mention in my talk is the effective component of cancer pain. Of course, it, it's almost impossible to study in the laboratory, but for many of these patients, they equate pain with death. And that might actually impact on what we find clinically and the measures. We might have an effective overlay that's hard to dissect out. Now, it, it, as, as you'll also find, and Judy has studied this extensively, that as these patients go through treatment, and oftentimes, including my own patients, they're going to get surgery, then they're going to get chemotherapy and radiation, there are separate pain syndromes associated with those treatments that are entirely different mechanisms than cancer pain. So it's really hard to study your very important question. However, if I have a patient where they have a cancer, it gets completely resected, they don't have a recurrence, and they don't have further treatment, they almost never have uh, pain again, and, and they're pain-free. Now, coming up against that response is the data that I've mentioned in the preclinical literature, which shows that there are changes in the central system, and the question is, are those important long-term in terms of pain behavior, and that we don't know. Brian, do you have other thoughts that you wanted to um, Well, I don't, I don't want to monopolize the, uh, the discussion, but I do have one more question in that you, know, you talked about the, the moving target, the heterogeneity of cancers, the, the accumulation of, of mutations that we know uh, occurs as cancers develop. So do you think that the, um, the fact that the pain is a moving target is related to uh, genetic changes that are specific within the genome, or is it due to the, the sort of the widespread changes? Because most of your mutations are going to be in non-coding regions, so you're essentially yeah. messing up the, the DNA and sort of overall homeostasis. Or do you think that it's actually because specific genes are being uh, dysregulated? So I, it's going to come down to specific genes, but the problem is those specific genes are going to change over time, and that's going to be in response to the patient's immune system and, as I mentioned, chemotherapy and radiation. I think we have an advantage, uh, let's say, as neuroscientists studying cancer pain as opposed to the oncologist who are trying to cure cancer. And the reason I say that is because the phenotype of the nerves, nervous system is fairly fixed, and that's what we're going after. The challenge is that as that cancer is evolving and it has these mutations that lead to a gain of function that then get passed on to further cells, those changes might produce and secrete a mediator that causes cancer pain. So that that's the challenge. But you're gonna have you're gonna have an enormous amount of mutations. I, I, I saw an article years ago that showed the average number of mutations for a colon cancer is thirty thousand. Almost all of those mutations are lethal, but a few of them give the cancer a proliferative advantage. And those mutations might lead to a product or a cellular activity that leads to pain. Great, thank you. DP, do you have any comments or questions that you wanted to raise? Yes, I do have. First of all, uh, I'd like to uh, say thank you to Brian. It was a phenomenal talk, and I, I could also learn a lot. Uh, and I uh, really completely support the idea of uh, 
uh, tumor microenvironment and how uh, highly critical it is and in terms of uh, that the brand's identification of uh, factors in human tumor microenvironment in these patients. It's really great. So uh, in that again brings us uh, my overarching question always is uh, 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 it's really important for us to know what is the tumor microenvironment in specific types of tumors and how they interact with the sensory uh, nerve afferents. And in that sense, uh, looking into the endocrine signal link, uh, my one question to Brian, which I, I would say I would uh, uh, kind of continue the question what Brian Davis also asked. So in terms of those patients who did not uh, have pain, even though they have tumors, is there a, a possibility or chance that uh, these are the subsets of patients who have uh, more secretion of endogenous opioids, which somehow in turn lead to their pain suppression and that's how they do not experience pain. Uh, so in that sense, are there subsets of patients who have a tumor uh, cell type subset which secrete more of these endogenous opioids or other analgesic components? Yeah, so uh, DP, again, an excellent question. And I think of cancer pain as really a balance between algesic and analgesic uh, mechanisms. Early on, I simply thought of it as the cancer producing algogenic mediators that then, then sensitize and activate primary afferents, innervating the cancer microenvironment, leading to pain. But I think it's uh, much more complex, and that complexity actually opens up opportunity. So I think that for a subset of these patients that don't have pain that it could be due to local opioid secretion. And uh, just going back to Nicole Schess' work in the laboratory, we're getting some um, early data that's suggesting that. So there's probably a subset that for whatever reason don't produce uh, pain producing mediators, but then there's another subset where it's this balance between pain producing and non pain producing mediators. Um, and I, I, you know, it's frustrating not to give you a more definitive answer, but I'll just tell you a number of years ago we published a paper on the genome of oral cancers and we looked at 89 oral cancers and we couldn't create a single subtype across that 89, they all looked very different. Um, so I think that they're going down different dysregulated genetic pathways. Um, certainly there's going to be certain common features, of course for pancreatic adenocarcinoma, KRAS is commonly mutated for all types of cancers, P53 is lost. But outside of that, few common mutations or changes, these cancers behave very differently. Um, and so, so it's hard to directly answer the question, but I certainly think that endogenous analgesic mechanisms explain some of the uh, some of the lack of pain. The other thing I should mention, and I think this was uh, in very early models published by the University of Minnesota group, they showed that late stage tumors in their preclinical models were not producing pain, so the pain seems to peak out. And I wonder, are those are those cancers somehow evolving over time? It could be due to destruction of afferents, but potentially they're evolving over time when late stage cancer analgesic mechanisms override the ones producing pain. Yeah. Yeah. EP, do you have any other thoughts or comments you wanted to share? Uh, I have a lot of thoughts, but I would open it up to the other uh, okay. uh, attendees to have the discussion. All right, so let's proceed then with um, some discussion. We've got some great questions. Um, the first one, let's continue on this um, mechanistic um, discussion before we get into treatment. There's obviously a lot of uh, interest in how we might treat pain, but related to mechanisms, do tumor cells use the nervous system to support their growth and invasion, and what are the mechanisms involved, and might glial cells play a role? in cancer pain? Um, so uh, the question is insightful and uh, certainly 
cancers are hijacking, for lack of a better term, their peripheral nervous system. Um, and Brian Davis has done some really interesting work using, and I didn't mention this model, but of course uh, mutant models are great to use because again they go down dysregulated pathways and go through that normal process of carcinogenesis. But he's shown uh, using a KRAS mutant model um, that there are changes in the cancer microenvironment. Uh, Pat Manti showed years ago with some beautiful confocal microscopy that in the area of prostate, and sar uh, prostate adenocarcinoma and sarcoma you get very very uh, robust neurogenesis. Um, and of course there's a number of overlapping factors including NGF that not only produce angiogenesis but also neurogenesis. There seems to be some crosstalk between the neurons and uh, cancer and a number of mediators including CGRP and substance P are released by uh, the nervous system that lead to a uh, cancer proliferation. So I think that uh, the nervous system is certainly involved. A more crude set of experiments uh, that have been done um, using transection of nerves that innervate certain regions. This has been shown for gastric carcinoma and transection of the vagus nerve. It's been shown in a preclinical model as well as patients who've had their vagus nerve cut. There seems to be decreased chance for recurrence. So uh, certainly the peripheral nervous system is involved and I would invite uh, Brian to potentially comment on that further. Um, I'd like to thank Brian for doing a really nice summary of uh, some of our recent data. The couple of things that I would add is that um, what we've looked at, and we did this in, in collaboration with uh, Catherine Albers and Andy Rim, who's now at MD Anderson, um, we've seen what I think is really important is the changes within the incipient uh, cancer cell uh, at the time when they're at, we're, we're studying pancreatic cancer. So during the precancerous stage, during the pan and lesion stage, we see dramatic changes in expression of growth factors in both in the neurotrophin family and the GDNF family that precedes the actual appearance of the tumors. And then the sensory nervous system responds uh, in a manner that's, that's a little bit scary in terms of uh, it's almost developmental in the response to these, this increase in growth factors. And we more recently have found that if we denervate it early, uh, prior to the development of, the, of these precancerous lesions, we can essentially um, uh, slow or completely stop the development of cancer in animals that were otherwise are assured of getting cancer. Um, but this is actually just one of our studies, just one of four studies that have found similar things in a model, a genetic model of gastric cancer, prostate cancer, and basal cell carcinoma more recently from Sonny Wong's lab at uh, Michigan. So this is sort of becoming a common finding that denervation will prevent the development of tumors in animals that would otherwise get them. And these, again, are all in genetically engineered mouse models. So it, it really indicates that there's some kind of conversation, and Brian used this term uh, earlier in this talk, between the, um, the tumor cells, the developing tumor cells, and the nervous system that is somehow conditioning the tumor microenvironment to make the uh, growth and development of tumors possible. EP, do you have anything you wanted to share? No, I think uh, they have already covered. <laughs> and okay. I, yeah. okay, great. So the questions are really interesting. Here's another one, Brian, um, about the importance of the cancer microenvironment for the development of pain. You did a superb job describing that for us. And since the cancer microenvironment is highly influenced by the cancer genome, could you comment on how you might see cancer uh, studies that combine cancer patient genome studies, so that looking at the patient, looking at the cancer, um, and exploring the genome, and how this might direct a more personalized treatment for cancer-related pain? Sure. So um, I, I am, I'm going to give my answer, and it's a little bit uh, depressing. Um, but I think there's opportunity on the pain side. So, of course, in 
to press and you'll often see uh, cancer centers and cancer institutes talking about personalized medicine. I think we're very far away from using the genome to tailor treatment. Um, after the uh, Human Genome Project was announced in 2002, there was a lot of press uh, through the White House as well as NIH that this was going to change cancer treatment. That was 13 years ago. Uh, Vint Sarich, who's a physical anthropologist, made a comment shortly after completion of the Human Genome Project, and he said, remember that the genome is a recipe and not a blueprint. That's very helpful in thinking about the genome. Just because you're changing the genome and you have that recipe available, it doesn't mean that's going to be the way the cell behaves. And that's why it's been so challenging. And while the genome has taught us a lot about possible mechanisms and simply the level of heterogeneity and genome instability, it hasn't led to much treatment in terms of cancer. Um, I think that this approach that I mentioned where we're taking the cancer and trying to get the cancer to do something um, that it has the potential to do but isn't doing it to its fullest such as secreting opioids might be a better approach as opposed to evaluating the cancer, uh, sequencing the cancer, trying to identify the target. That's just, it's too much data and it changes over time. Um, to give you an example, studies have been done looking at prostate adenocarcinoma in men. And you can look at prostate adenocarcinoma and sequence the genomes, and it looks like 20 different patients in the single cancer. You can also take a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, sequence the pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and look at one of the metastases, whether it's to the liver or the peritoneum, and they're completely different. And so that's why I think that that approach of personalized medicine will be, will be a challenge. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen in my professional lifetime, but I do think potentially cancer pain management uh, could change as we start to understand how the cancers are interacting with the microenvironment. Like the data that Brian alluded to, potentially you could change the innervation because the receptors that you have to address on the peripheral afferents is significantly reduced relative to the receptors and mediators on the cancer. So that might be a more viable target for us. Wonderful. Brian, I have a a question that um, might be a little out there, but this is from me, not from the audience. Have you, you've primarily been focusing on squamous cell carcinomas um, in the oral cavity. Have you ever looked at HPV-associated tumors, and do you see a difference since we now have these um, two different common models of uh, head and neck kinds of pain from cancer? Yeah. So, uh, Judy, your, your question is not out there. In fact, it's dead on. And um, there was a study published, uh, it's been a while since I've taken a look at it, I think it was 2014, uh, by Slaughter's group where they compared HPV positive or pharyngeal cancer to HPV negative or pharyngeal and looked at pain levels. And just because the audience might not not be aware of oropharyngeal cancer. That's the fastest growing cancer in this country in the Western world. It's expected to increase significantly between now and 2030 when the vaccine will start to have an effect. Um, for oropharyngeal cancer, there are two types. There's those that are due to HPV, and it's the same types that cause cervical cancer, 16, 18, 31, and 45. And about 70% of oropharyngeal cancer are HPV positive. Now what about the HPV negative? Well those actually behave like oral squamous cell carcinoma which I've just spoken about. Oral squamous cell carcinoma is not related to HPV and this is commonly misunderstood um, including uh, practitioners who treat this type of cancer because the oral pharynx is the base of the tongue, it's behind the circumvallate papillae and the oral cavity is in front of the tongue which is ahead or anterior to circumvallate papillae. These two structures are literally millimeters apart, but they behave very differently. 
oral squamous cell carcinoma have very low rates of HPV infection, about 3 to 5 percent. Well, it turns out in that paper that I mentioned, it's the HPV negative or pharyngeal cancer that cancers that cause more pain. They behave more like oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma and have uh, more pain. The HPV positive oral pharyngeal tend to be painless. Also, what's nice for patients is they respond very nicely to radiation and chemotherapy. And in fact, if you have oral pharyngeal cancer, you're much better off if it's due to HPV. So there's certainly differences. Thank you. Thanks. So another question from our audience relates to Brian's earlier remark about peripheral versus central mechanism. And there's a question about whether there might be any kinds of brain imaging studies in cancer pain patients that have been conducted trying to elucidate these uh, more central mechanisms. Is anyone on the panel, Brian, aware of, of that work being done? Um, so I'll just quickly speak. I'm, I'm not aware of studies that have been done in cancer patients. I, I would love to see such work, but I, I've not seen functional MRI or other types of imaging done on cancer pain patients. Yeah, I can't think of any offhand. Yeah, I haven't seen any studies so far. Nor have I. All right. So we're we're also being asked about um, the importance of models, and you, you did a brilliant job sharing with us um, how the model has to be valid. Um, and there's a question here about preclinical findings um, have significance in the clinical setting, and that, for example, chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy is common, and it's a critical side effect of chemotherapy, which then can worsen the existing cancer-related pain. Have you used any models where, either in your murine models or in your human models, the individual first underwent chemotherapy, and then um, you conducted some of these same kinds of trials? Um, so I, I've. I've tried to be very disciplined with our research group where we're, we're simply focused on cancer pain and I, I should have mentioned that up front. So the, the area that we study are those patients who are diagnosed with cancer and the pain that they have. We have not looked uh, post treatment. The only study where we've looked post-treatment are um, that group of patients that I use to validate the pain questionnaire. Uh, but as you know, uh, almost better than anyone, Judy, what happens with these patients is shortly after their diagnosis, they have such complex treatment um, and it's really hard to disambiguate these different mechanisms. What I can tell you from a, a practitioner side is is that it results in a very low quality of life for these patients where not only do they have this problem of dealing with a terminal illness, but they have multiple different pain syndromes and you might relieve one and you're, you're left dealing with the other. The other thing that I should have mentioned up front is I talk about the studies and, and people that I've been uh, able to uh, read and talk with, but without question, I've learned the most from listening to my cancer patients and their families. And I strongly encourage anyone who's interested in a pain syndrome, even if you're a, a straight ahead formidable uh, biologist or neuroscientist, you can learn so much about the mechanisms by uh, talking to patients. And certainly for me and our group and the time that people in our group have spent with patients, that's really what sets up the framework of how we're going to address the problem. Judy, if I could just throw in two cents here. Um, I think it's critical, and I really like Brian's model of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, 4 and QO model, where you get this um, slowly developing, more naturalistic looking cancer. And uh, Jamie Solomon in my lab, who did the, the, the original work on in our, our PDEC animal, our, our pancreatic cancer animal, has been trying to do the kind of studies you're talking about, looking at um, the development, um, uh, trying to do sort of a CPEN thing in a cancer model. And the problem is that 
working with these now more naturalistic genetic models is ridiculously expensive. It's incredibly difficult to breed the number of animals that you need. Uh, we're, we're, she's currently trying to do a experiments where we're trying to repeat man, pet mantis stuff with anti-NGF in, uh, in adults when the cancer is developing. And it's so hard to get enough animals. We talk about enrolling our animals just like you enroll a patient into a trial. Um, I was hoping I'd get uh, the chance to make a pitch that NIH or someone needs to come up with a mechanism to make these kind of genetic animals or these models uh, available to more researchers and not just the people who can get over that energy or, or dollar threshold to breed enough animals. Because um, I think it would really push the field forward if someone could order some of these genetic models, you know, four or five or even ten animals. I think a lot of work could be done and the, the field could go forward much faster if more investigators could get their hands on these models and do the experiments they want to do, test, um, do their CPIN, their, their neuropathic um, chemo, chemotherapeutic uh, neuropathy pain models in a cancer model. I think that's really critical and it's a big hole right now in the field. Yeah, I, I will add a couple of points. Um, first of all, uh, looking in the tumor microenvironment and in relation to model, animal model, uh, certainly Brian has developed really good models. We still need to develop more and more uh, uh, valid and viable and more clinically relevant uh, preclinical models. Uh, so for that we need to first learn about uh, the human pain and uh, I completely echo Brian's uh, 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 suggestions and advice to actually uh, see the patients or just observe the patient and you can learn so many uh, mechanistic views from them and then back model those into animals. And in terms of coming back to CIPN on a cancer model, we are, we are also trying to develop uh, a CIPN in conjunction with a metastatic bone tumor model such as prostate and breast cancers. And again, I also echo the same concerns Brian Davis uh, raised, the uh, animals are incredibly expensive and the number of animals in these type of metastatic models where we put the tumor cells into bloodstream and they uh, naturally metastasize. So uh, the frequency of those is often so low. So that itself is a challenge. And then uh, studying the CIPN in those, it's going to be really complex because uh, we have uh, CIPN has more neuropathic component and uh, the cancer, primary cancer or bone metastasized cancer pain is more or less uh, like in a strong inflammatory component. So what we are going to see is a like crossover between those which is going to be incredibly difficult to I think distinguish because we have uh, many uh, overlapping mechanisms as well as overlapping uh, behavioral paradigms which are assessed in uh, preclinical models. So it is uh, definitely challenging but I think uh, more and more people thinking about it and uh, developing uh, valid animal models it would be really good in terms of uh, taking this field further. Thank you. Yes, animal models are essential to understand this really complex problem. We have one time for one more question, um, and here's the question, it's, does anyone, panelist Brian, anyone have thoughts about the role of microRNA in the cancer microenvironment? Um, so I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just speak to that. I don't know of a, a single study in preclinical models that, have, that has looked at the role of microRNA um, in terms of contributing or allowing us to classify or in some way genotype uh, cancer pain. Um, certainly there's been work with other pain models that is showing that uh, microRNA might give us a signature to identify pain phenotypes, but I'm not aware of anything in the cancer pain field. Of course, again, with 
the cancer pain, the challenge is that you're, de you're dealing with an extremely complex uh, nucleic acid repertoire with the cancers. And so it's going to be very different in a microRNA study in a cancer patient, especially looking in the cancer microenvironment, versus uh, say a patient with rheumatoid arthritis where uh, it's much less dynamic. Great. Well, we are at the end of our time. I just wanted to thank you all um, and, and remind us of the importance of this. 90% of all people with cancer will experience pain at some point during the course of their illness, either from the cancer itself or from the treatment. And Brian and Brian and DP, all of the work that you're doing is so exquisitely important. Um, to our patients and on behalf of our patients, I want to thank you all and, and many thanks to Pain Research Forum for devoting this time to such an important topic and I'm going to turn the microphone back to Neil. Great. Uh, thanks, Judy. So as we wrap up here on behalf of PRF, I'd really like to thank Brian for such a wonderful presentation today. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, we also would like to thank our panelists, Brian Davis, DP Mohapatra and of course our moderator Judy Pace for a great panel discussion and also want to thank all of our attendees for listening into the webinar and for submitting your questions. Just wanted to mention one final note that we'll have a recording of the webinar available within the next day or two on PRF and so if you'd like a replay or if you have some colleagues who might like to listen but weren't able to attend today, you'll be able to access the recording shortly on PRF. It'll be on um, the webinar page on PRF that's the voted specifically to, to this webinar on cancer pain. So with that said, we hope you enjoyed the webinar today. Thanks again, everybody, for attending and for participating, and hope to see you at the next one. So take care. Bye-bye.